we dive into Philippians chapter 2, we'll begin with verse 12 uh, this morning. As we look at being the light, and one of the things that uh, we see is one of the greatest means of motivation is a great illustration, for example. And we can go through uh, different things, and somebody can tell you something, but until you see it lived out, until you have seen it uh, acted out, it's hard sometimes for us to understand the true merit and worth of it. And it's always one of my favorite movies about this time of the year uh, to watch, to get me pumped up and ready for uh, football season is the movie Rudy. About a little boy who dreamed of nothing more than being a fighting Irish from Notre Dame. He wanted to play on the football team. He did everything he could. He volunteered with a, a student group so that he could go and just spray paint and polish the helmets just so that he could be part of the Irish. And then he finally made it onto the team, and the uh, coach that he had said, well, you know you're not the best, but I'll let you play. One game in your senior year. Well, that coach didn't stay for his senior year, and the new coach came in and didn't want to have anything to do with them, and nobody wanted uh, him to play, and then you have all these team members that came in and laid their jerseys on the coach's desk and said, let Rudy play for me. Let Rudy play for me. And so the coach had nobody on the team to play for him, play with him. And all the jerseys are piled up there. So he finally puts Rudy in, and he ends up being the only player to have ever been carried out of the stadium on the shoulders of the players. And it's a great story, and it's a great movie to see when you show leadership and you show uh, that you are hardworking and you're willing to do whatever it takes that people will follow and respect you. As we left off last week, Paul showed the greatest example of humility, of what humility looks like in the fact that Jesus humbled himself, emptied himself out, and took on the form of of a lowly servant came to earth, left the splendors of heaven so that we could accept that amazing grace that we just sang about. So that we could be a child of a king and know that he will walk beside us all the way and provide for our needs. But Paul goes a step farther here, beginning in verse 12, 18 and tells us there is something else that you need to be doing. So if you have it with me, stand as we read Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in both you to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, by holding firm to the world holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. There's a lot of things that we see in this passage and if we're to be spiritually mature and live pleasing 
to our Father, we must strive to follow the example that Christ left for us. And the first sign that we come to is there is a spiritual work that must be done. We see that in verses 12 and 13. We consider all aspects Paul addressed our obligation to be engaged in a spiritual work for God. We see that in verse 12. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. He's saying, it's great that you do it when I'm here, but I need you to do it when I'm not here. That's one of the signs of integrity. One of the definitions that we use all the time is doing what is right when no one else is looking. Because if you're doing it just so that others can see you, then you've got your reward. You've got your pat on the back. But see, it's a spiritual work, so we're not doing it for each other. We're not doing it for other people. We're doing it for God. Colossians tells us that let everything that we do, do it unto God. Let your work be as if he is your boss. And you're doing everything for him. It's an obedience in our faith. You know, this I mentioned it when we started, that this is the only book that Paul wrote that he doesn't have some type of warning. That he doesn't have to take the church to task on something. And so here in Philippi, he's commending them for their consistent faith and overall. You have done excellent, but I need you to keep doing it whether I'm here with you or whether I am away. He's exhorting them. Now, in case you don't remember or you uh, or you have forgotten what exhortation means, it simply is a communication emphatically urging someone to do something. It's not just the simple, okay. I, I urge you to take a bath. I urge you to wash your hands at, before you eat. It's, I mean, I'm on my hands and I'm my knees and I am begging you, please, please, I need you to do this. That's what that exhortation is, but it's in a positive way. It's not, you're doing this wrong. It's, you're doing such a good job, but I beg of you, please don't stop. Because if you stop, then we've got a problem. Because the world that we live in, as we'll see in a little bit, is a messed up, screwed up world. Because the generations before ours left us a mess, and we didn't learn from their mistakes, and we've left a mess for the next generation, and I hate to see what the mess this current generation is going to leave behind. See, Paul starts out by saying, therefore. So he's actually calling them back to what he just said, that therefore, after seeing what Christ went through for you and for me, then we need to be doing a spiritual work. Remember, he talked about that if you're going to do something and you're going to show the humility of Christ, we need to be serving others. Well, we can't serve others if we're so full of ourselves. That's why he said at the end of verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, in no way is he contradicting what he says in Ephesians 2. 8 through 10, that we're saved by grace through faith and not of our own works. He's not saying that you work for your salvation. What he's saying is because you have salvation, you need to be working. It's going along the same lines that James told us in chapter 2. Be doers of the word, not just hearers only. If you have faith, see it here in verse 17 of James chapter 2. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. See, if we're just doing things on our own, and it's not because of our faith that we're doing it, then all we're doing is going through the motions. And for too long, for too many years, for too many people, that's all church is, is let's go through the motions. Well, it's Sunday, that's what we do. We come to church. I joked about it last week. That growing up, I had a drunk problem. I was drunk to church every time the door was open. And it didn't help that Dad was a deacon, so he had a key to the church. So we were there even when nobody else was there. So, Saturday nights, you knew exactly what you were doing. You took your shower, then you laid out your clothes for church in the morning, and you polished your shoes, you had everything ready. So all you had to do was get up, get dressed, and get to church. And before anybody else was there, there we were. And after everybody else left, there we were. It was a given that you were going to be in church because that's what you do. In my mind. And their mind is what you do because of your love and your dedication to Christ. To me, growing up as a kid, I didn't have enough intelligence to understand that. It was just something that you always do. You know it's important, but that's it. He said, I need you to know why you're doing this. I don't need you just simply to come because that's what you're supposed to. I need you to come because, one, you want to be here, but two, because you know there's something for you to do here. We're not called to be bumps on a log or bumps on a church pew. We are called to be workers in the field for Christ, whether that be outside telling people about Christ, or it could simply be being present in the building, cleaning the pews, cleaning the bathrooms, cleaning and taking out the trash. All of that is important tasks that take place, and it's not because we're doing it so that somebody walks into the bathroom or walks into a room and sees the empty trash and says, oh wow, they cleaned, aren't they good? This must be a wonderful church. We're doing it because that's what God wants us to do. Because we see in verse 13, Paul tells us, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's where it all comes down to. We work spiritually because God has put it in our hearts to serve Him. When we don't serve Him, we can't ever expect Him to bless us, to reward us. Paul knew the Philippians would question how such a thing were possible. Through mere human effort and ability, it is impossible for us to do what is good. Remember, Romans 3 tells us that we are nothing but despicable. The best that we could ever do in our entire lives combined into one big event is still not good enough for God to even blink an eye of approval to us. Paul tells us in chapter 7, there's a war going on. And the things I want to do is the very things that I don't. And the things that I hate are the very things that I do. What a wretched worm am I? Okay, nothing we can do is ever good. And we're a worm, a worm and not just a worm, a wretched worm. Yeah, we're really good. So how is it possible to do things good for God? Because God puts it in our hearts and in our minds in our souls to do it. And the way that he does that is because not only are we physically working, but there's a spiritual work that we are diving into his word. We're studying, not for a lesson, but studying, as he tells a young preacher named Timothy, study to show yourself approved. 
a worker who does not need the That we can see what God has for us. Not just for everybody, but us specifically. We have the ability to serve the Lord correctly because He provides us the ability. It's a humbling thing. The knowing who you and I are and how worthless you and I are in our sins, that God could still look down at us and say, you know what? I love them and can use them. And then he gives us a job to do. We have absolutely nothing to boast in of ourselves because we can't do this of our own doing. You tried to do something before? Messed up completely? Miserably? Me and Dad tried hanging the door. <clears throat> that, that was a disaster. So we got smart. We'd get the one that's all put together. Has the trim and everything. All you got to do is slide it in. That didn't work much better either. Doesn't help when you don't look at the instructions either. It's like the, the father on Christmas Eve that was putting together a playhouse for his, uh, his children. He stays up all night long putting it together and he finally has it built. And kind of looked at him and said, Well, it looks a little lopsided, but he kind of pushes on it and says, Well, it seems a little sturdy. He looks down and he's got all these parts laying on the floor and his wife comes in and says, well, what are those ones? Oh, uh, they're just spare parts. And then a couple of hours later as the kids come out and they start playing on it, and you hear a crash and the cries and he looks and then he gets that look. comes over and hands them the instructions and says there's not supposed to be any spare parts and read it next time. <laughs> yeah. When we don't read the instructions, we're never going to get the product done right. If we're not reading God's instructions, we'll never be able to serve God and work for Him the way that we should. For living in obedience to Christ, making a difference in the lives of others, then we should praise the Lord for the ability that He has given us. He has given us, not of ourselves. So we have a, a spiritual work, but there's also a social walk that we should undertake. Here we come back again to what I've been harping on this entire time, our walk talks louder than our talk talks. So Paul's about to ask him that deep question. Is your walk talking louder than your talk talks? Look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do I have to? Really? We watched uh, one lady that we enjoy uh, watching on uh, YouTube. Every time she kids are told, oh, golly. Yeah. We love to grumble and complain. I think that's probably a natural thing for us before even walking, talking, or even as we heard this morning from the few little baby, the cooing and the giggles. We like to grumble and complain. Because we want it our way. And if it's not grumbling enough, then we murmur under our breath. Yeah. All that does is just get us in more trouble. 
Having served the Lord for years in a variety of environments, Paul knew the difficulties associated with serving the Lord publicly. As we saw in our Bible study on the book of Acts, Paul was thrown in jail. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He was thrown in prison. He was basically beaten to an inch of his life because he spoke about Christ. And then as we saw a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, all of that, all of that means that I'm living, and if I'm living, I'm going to keep on preaching about Christ because that's all it is for me. But if I die, then I'm with him, so life or death is all about Christ. And if he could endure those kind of beatings, I mean, this isn't a tongue lashing. This is physical hands, rocks, whips, chains, prison door cells. If he could endure all of that because he knew that God was that important and letting people know that they had to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ to ever have hope and peace in this world and to ever have a future, if he could go through all of that, then we don't have any excuse. Amen. Oh, so somebody calls you one of those fanatical Jesus friends. And? If we're going to call you a freak for something, might as well make it something worthwhile. Amen. Well, people are going to look weird at us. They look weird at you anyway. Might well let them look weird at you for something worthwhile. Some within the church would even question the true motives. See, everyone didn't receive this teaching of God. People in churches today don't receive this teaching. Because we want to have our ears tickled. We want something that makes us feel good. Make us happy. So that we go out and we have a smile on our face until the world slaps us across the face. And then we're a basket case for a week until we can come back and hear something nice. And make us feel like we can just dance through to Yeah. Christianity was never called for wins. It takes real men, real women, to profess their love for Christ. And especially in a world that we live in today. Because people would do everything they could back then, and even more so now that they would do everything to mar our image as believers. Oh, you're one of those homophobes because we preach what the Bible says. But you're one of those judging Christians because we preach what the Bible says. Well, you just, you're intolerant. You don't accept anymore. Because we preach what the Bible says. But they don't understand. We love those that are caught up in those lifestyles. We don't hate them. We love them and want them to know we true. But we can't tell them, oh, well, it's okay, God. God will forgive you. It's okay. Yes, he will forgive you if you turn from that. Just like he will forgive you from stealing if you turn from that. He will forgive you from lying if you would turn from that. He's not going to forgive you when you keep doing the same 
thing because you're really not sorry. You're just sorry somebody found out. We often want to lash out when someone wrongly accuses us or questions our motives. But that's not bringing people to Christ when we bite our heads off. And the reason why we don't need to murmur and complain is because of what the first part of verse 15 tells us. So that we may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. The King James Version puts it in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That doesn't leave much to live in. When we live in a nation where it's easier to condemn Christians for the sinful behavior, there's a problem. When it's okay for us to riot in the streets, to burn down buildings, to kill people, to murder unborn children, to get my vengeance and that's all okay. But heaven forbid you set foot into a church house. There's a problem. There's a problem when you're told, check your morality and your beliefs outside the door when you go to vote. There's a problem. When we are told that we have to be accepting and tolerant of everything under the sun, there's a problem when it goes against what God's Word says. Nowhere are we told in Scripture that it is okay for us to be with the same sex. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us that God made a mistake when He created us. And that you can be a boy today and a girl tomorrow and then a boy again the next day. However you want to identify yourself as. You know what? I want to identify myself as a dog. That way I can just lay and sleep and people will bring me food. And I get petted all day long. You would look at me like I was a lunatic. But it's the same thing. You lost your freaking minds when you get so far off from what you were created to be. We need to come and stand on what God's Word says. So if they come and they attack us, they can't attack us for what we're doing. They can only attack us for what we're standing on. Now, if we're participating and these hate crimes and we're going out and we're beating people up because they're different than us, then by all means we need to be locked up. Because nobody has the right to beat up anybody just because we're different. Because here's the thing, we're not different. We're all the human race, we all bleed the same color, and we all die, and there's an afterlife. But when people say that we're different, we as believers should be different. Because we look different, we smell different, and we sound different. Because we don't look and act the way the world acts, we act and look the way that Christ does. Because when we're doing that, then we are doing something totally different. And they don't know what to do with us. Because they attack us and we, well, thank you. I'm glad somebody noticed that I was different. So I landed all the time and somebody would get on him or would um, make fun of him. Just laugh and agree with him. You're stupid. Yeah, I am pretty stupid. I just go on. If you don't play into their little game, it could 
accuses them to death. And they don't know what to do. Because they're coming after you so that you'll come back after them. Or even better. Yeah, I make stupid mistakes. But God loves me in spite of it. He saved me. He can save me too. They really don't know what to do then. It's amazing how quiet they did. The believers in Philippi were reminded that they were to present themselves in a manner that was pleasing to to the Lord without rebuke as they presented him in the midst of a crooked and perverse people. If the people that we come in contact with think that Jesus is a Mr. Rogers type of a person or he is a uh, Maximus type of person from Uh, from a gladiator, then they have a mixed up view of who Jesus really is. Because what people think of Jesus is based upon the Jesus they see in us. Oh, I was supposed to give you ear tickly. See, the value of walking away rather than being caught up in a fruitless argument means that you are showing Christ-like behavior. Because we'll never win anyone to Christ by getting into a shouting match and into a debate with them. But you show them his love, his care, his mercy. Remember what the scripture says, love covers a multitude of sins. We need those who will set the example for others to follow. Those who live above reproach, bringing honor to the Lord and credibility to his church. So we have a spiritual work that we are to do, a social walk that we're supposed to be walking, but then we have a scriptural witness that we need to be disciplined. Here Paul speaks of the witness that we are to present among the world, particularly the unsaved. Look at the end of verse 15. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, echoing what Jesus said himself on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, that we are to be the light of the world, a city set on a hill, so that the world will see. We're told that we are to do our good works before men, not so we get the glory, but so that others will see our Father in heaven and will worship him. We are to be a light. You know that little song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Nobody's watching. So I can let it shine. Oh, but somebody's coming. This little light of mine, now that they're gone, I can let it shine. That's not being a witness. That's being a That's what turns the world off from the church. We are called to be witnesses of Him, and not just the witnesses of Him, but a scriptural witness, which means that what this word of God says about us, we live up to it. We do what it says. 
Because it's amazing. If we knew what it says, it does what it says. If we live according to it, God upholds his end of the bargain, and he does what he says he'll do. We need to shine for Jesus. The darker the world gets, the more noticeable our light will be, if it will shine. Verse 16 tells us a way that we can do that is by sharing the gospel with others. But we need to hold fast to the word of life. Shining for Christ was imperative. But that alone wasn't enough. If we just share, and that's it, they'll never see how to live it. But they can't know how to live it if we aren't living it. Christ had given himself as the atonement for sin. He rise triumphantly from the grave, providing forgiveness from sin, reconciling us to God and eternal life. These are hard things to believe if you can't see that there was a life that was changed because of it. Our friends, the Gibbs in Arizona, as they are sharing to these Indian tribes, most of them have never heard the gospel. And as a traditional Indian tribe, they worship many gods. And God for all different aspects of nature. But for them to come together and know that there is only one true God and that he has a plan for them, if they never see it in action, it's hard for them to ever believe that that could happen. We cannot and must not assume that someone else will share the gospel with those we know who are unsaved. We must share the gospel ourselves. It's not somebody else's job to reach the lost. It's your job and my job to reach the lost. And Jesus tells his disciples when they were going out, right before he ascended to heaven, he didn't say, now somebody out there is going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. He said, you are my witnesses. He says the same thing to us this morning. So someone outside of this building is going to be my witnesses. He says, you sitting here this morning, you standing here delivering this message this morning, are my witnesses. Now get up and go do something. We share, but we also serve. The rest of verse 16 tells us, So that in the day of Christ, I, Paul, may be proud that I ran in vain or labored in vain, but that I've not run in vain. Paul reveals that their faithful servant brings rejoicing. Because being faithful to serve others means you're doing what you've been taught. As parents, we don't just teach our children what's right and wrong. At least that's not all we should be teaching. We should be teaching them, our kids, how to live their lives, how to be citizens of this country, how to be citizens of heaven, how to respect our government, respect our military, respect our um, first responders, how to conduct their lives, and how to live without us being around them. Because if all we do is coddle them and hold their hands and give them everything they want or desire, what's going to happen 
when mommy and daddy are gone and they're left by themselves, they're going to be completely lost. They will have no clue on how to even turn on a microwave. If we do that for our children, why has the church stopped doing that for God's children? Why have we, as God's children, stopped doing that for our brothers and sisters? We need to be showing others that we do this for God. Our faithfulness to the Lord encourages us knowing that we will give account for our actions. Everything that we say, everything we do, we are accountable for. <clears throat> that is. Our service to the Lord is individual, but it is never isolated. Our labor for the Lord impacts many more than will ever Ever because you never know what little bit of kindness that you show today has a ripple effect down the years to affect the next generation of people. And then the final thing that we see from our text is there is a substantial willingness in the closing verses, Paul discusses the believer's willingness to serve the Lord. Look at verse 17. He tells us, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. That's pretty big. It's not just talking points or to make uh, and look good or sound good or in fear the people to Paul. He's not being a politician. He's being sincere. I know my time is short. I know I'm going to die very soon. Remember, he's writing this in a Roman jail cell and according to most Believers, it was, I mean, most scholars, it wasn't a whole lot of years after that he was put to death. I know my time is short. I'm willing to be poured out, but knowing that your faith is strong and you're living your faith out and letting your light shine, I agree with you. Now isn't that what we should be doing? Isn't that what we should be saying? That if our life was to end right now and we didn't make it out of this building, would others know that we meant what we said when we set it inside this wall? Are we just saying it because this is church and we don't live it when we get outside? He was genuinely committed to serving the Lord and serving the gospel and sharing the gospel, even if it meant his life being ended. Are we willing to do the same thing? Are we willing to share the gospel? And to speak the truth and live it, even if it costs us everything, our house, our family, our friends, our money. And if you don't think it couldn't happen, just let it. When the government starts telling you you can't go to church, it's not going to be that much farther until... They get the stupid idea 
that King Darius did. And told David, you can't pray me. We live in a twisted generation. Where what is wrong is right. And what is right is wrong. Somebody needs to stand up. you look out at the majority of the protests that have been going around, the majority of the protesters are age 30 and below. Unfortunately, the majority of the rioters are ages 25 and below. We're going to protest. Let's protest something look like. And I'm not saying that they weren't. But there's nothing worthwhile to riot over. But we're going to protest. Let's protest the fact that people are trying to take God out of this world. Because we need to stand up in the face of opposition. If we are unwilling to walk with him while there is little opposition, we won't walk with him when there's much persecution. Paul counted it joy to be persecuted. He counted it joy to suffer. He counted it as excitement to know that what he was going through was light compared to what Christ went through, but it's to bring salvation to other people. He got all giddy inside. Somebody says one bad thing about us and we're a basket case and suicidal. We need to get over ourselves and get Christ all over us. Say, we need to rejoice with those that are sharing and preaching and suffering for the name of Christ. Paul tells us in verse 18, likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with. Paul knew that the Philippian church was strong in their faith. They shared the commitment of Paul and were willing to stand boldly for Christ. They were mature, who counted it all joy to serve the Lord. Can that be said of us this morning? That we are bold in sharing our faith? that we don't back down in the face of persecution. The modern church needs to share this enthusiasm and faith. And unfortunately, we have done nothing but back down. There is a tendency to separate, in a sense, from the body of Christ when many leave the building. This building that we are in this morning is not the church. It is just a building. We are the church. Church is not a place we attend, it's who we are, a life we live. We too must be willing to count it all joy regarding every service in the name of Christ. Regardless of what we face, if we are afforded an opportunity to share the gospel and witness to Christ, we're blessed. Our text today reveals 
what that actually looks like to have the same mind of Christ. And it's sobering. Do we possess the mind of Christ? Do our lives resemble the aspects of Christian life described in this text? If not, they should. And to be honest, we all have room for improvement. So as we prepare for our invitation this morning, do you sense a need to draw closer to the Lord while striving to obtain the mind of Christ? Do you sense a need to draw closer to the Lord while striving to obtain the mind of Christ? Do you know Him in a personal way as your Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, you're missing out. And instead of persecution, in the end, you will have prosecution. Or because of your sin that you have not turned over to Christ and asked Him into your heart, you will spend an eternity in a place that is very real. Here's the greatest thing. There is nothing that you and I have ever done that is so far that God can't forgive us. If we would just call Come to the cross and receive the free be the light to the world and come to Christ for the needs we have in our life. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us and that you gave us your son as an example of how we are to walk in the world. May we strive every day to have your mind that we are willing to serve others, to share and live out your word. That we will stand on what your word says walk in your world and not as the world lives. And may we rejoice with those who share and suffer for your name. Give us the desire and the love to do whatever it takes until all has heard it, to share your name with the world. In these things we pray. Let's stand as we worship this morning at the cross.